What happened here in the summer of 1940? 4. Hadamar. What treatment are you here for? Hadamar is a small, very sleepy town of 12,500, two hours by train from Frankfurt in the German state of Hesse. Before arriving at the station, the train slows down, passing tracks grown over with weeds and what seems to be an older, now unused station, a rectangular brown-bricked stationmaster's building emblazoned with old German Gothic letters, Hadamar. On a hill, a brown building with turrets on each side, a cross in the middle, looms over the empty train station. I am the only person to get off the train. I pass nobody as I follow the signs for the Gedenstadt. The Gedenstadt doesn't open until 9 a.m. I am early. I sit outside in my wheelchair, waiting in front of a large late 19th century, pale yet bright yellow building, and wait for the memorial to open. On House 5, which houses the Gedenstadt, I notice signs for ergotherapy program, another for Wohn- und Pflegenheim, residential and nursing home. This is still a working psychiatric facility. Soon some people pass by, some with ID tags identifying them as staff, others I assume to be patients. Someone with a staff ID stops. What treatment are you here for? She asks. Do you know where to go? It is then, here at Hadamar, the historical link between physical disability and the psychiatric disabilities that define most of the T4 victims is made clear. Even today, the usual assumption is if someone is physically disabled, they are also intellectually disabled. Though I've written about this stigma and taught about this stigma, this is the first time I've experienced it so intimately. When a church bell rings nine times, I enter House 5. The Hadamar Insane Asylum was established in 1883. It was originally a correctional house during what is described as a period in which, due to population growth at the end of the 19th century, an increase in fringe and problem groups in larger industrial overcrowded areas, and an increased interest in the security needs of the state, an increasing number of mentally and physically ill people were sent to so-called mental institutions. In 1904, a regional mental institution was added to the site. The regional parliament decreed the intensified demands and difficulties of the labor force increased alcohol abuse and sexual wantonness will make themselves felt to a special extent in the increases in the number of the mentally disturbed. From 1906, the institution was used as a nursing home, and after 1920, an educational facility for female psychopaths was added. The law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring was passed on July 14, 1933. In its 1934 annual report, the Hadamar Institution stated that it had submitted sterilization applications for 30% of its patients. The report states, those based on congenital feeble-mindedness dominate. We chose those cases first of all, as they constitute the most serious pecuniary burden to the state. Since the beginning of the war, the Hadamar Institution had also been used as a reserve military hospital. In the winter of 1940, the military hospital was disbanded and rebuilt as a killing center. A gas chamber, two crematoriums, reception rooms, rooms for staff, and an administrative block that included an office for vital statistics, a department for letters of condolence, the distribution of urns, 10,000 people were killed at Hadamar, and after the official end of T4, 
another 5,000, including German soldiers who could not be psychologically cured, were killed by drug overdose or neglect. In the memorials exhibit, there is a photograph of what could be a group of German friends or family, some with bikes, on a weekend outing in a rural setting. Only by reading the caption are those in the photograph identified as a photograph of T4 staff enjoying a day in the countryside. Near this photograph is the story of a staff party held in the crematorium in celebration of the killing of the 10,000th T4 victim. Late in the summer of 1941, the killing of the 10,000th patient was celebrated in what is described as a grotesque ceremony. The corpse of a patient with hydrocephalus was laid out with decorations on a barrow in the cellar, while an employee imitated a priest. All those present were given a bottle of beer. The celebration was subsequently continued in the upper floors. I take the elevator down to the basement where there are remains of the crematoria. This is also where the gas chamber is located. Abruptly, the elevator stops. It seems it has reached the lower floor, but the door doesn't open. I'm trapped. Though I grew up on the 15th floor of a Brooklyn apartment building, I've never been stuck in an elevator before. I know the German word Notruf, emergency. I press what I assume to be the emergency button. It worked last week, says a woman's voice from the other side of the elevator door. Is she speaking to me or to someone who is with her? Last week. That means I am the first person who needed the elevator to visit the exhibit since then? Just wait, the voice says. We've called maintenance and security. They should be here soon. Of course I wait. What else could I do? I remember what I've learned. After the gray buses belonging to the Shell Company, Charity for the Transportation of the Sick, arrived with patients from the intermediate institutions, the patients were led into the building, into a large reception hall. That is where they waited. The nurses who had accompanied the transit helped the patients undress. Then the nurses led the men and women who were clothed only in old military blankets to a room where staff checked personal information and a physician determined a false cause of death. In another room, the patients were weighed, measured, and photographed. At the steps to the basement, other personnel took over. How in all of this process, which involved numerous people and technology, did nothing go wrong? Did any of the buses break down? Did a gas pipe get clogged? If so, we don't know about it. But this also begs the question, if in resistance something could have done to slow, if not halt, the killing. I hear a jangle of keys. I hear someone trying to pry open the elevator door. Eventually, after a few tries, the door is open. We're so sorry, the woman says. The maintenance man, or is he security, seems proud of himself. He chuckles to himself as I wheel out of the elevator. My rescuers depart. Inside the gas chamber, there are black and white squares of the tiled floor. It could be the bathroom floors I've seen in some New York City apartments or the bathrooms of official buildings. But here, in the center of the floor, is a metal slatted drain with a round hole. Three quarters of the wall is covered in off-white, yellowish tiles, larger than those on the floor, which could be found in the shower room of a gym. There is a small arched recessed window at what seems like street level. The window lets in a sliver of light. Suspended from the ceiling is a metal rod, a pipe with a nozzle in the middle. From there the gas flowed into the room. In the gas chamber door 
There is a small circular window. This is from where the doctor who turned on the gas watched the patients die. Why do I notice all of this? Why do I make a note to remember to find out the measurements of the room? How does wanting to know precise details relate to my role as vicarious witness? More importantly, how do I feel? Up to 60 people were squeezed inside the chamber. The air raid doors were sealed. The killing physician turned a valve and let carbon monoxide gas into the gas chamber until all the patients were killed. What took place in this room and in similar rooms across Germany and its occupied lands is to me unimaginable. But what happened did happen. I've heard of those who visiting these rooms gasp for air. But here in the Hadamar gas chamber, I don't feel panic. I am not afraid. No trace of anger. Disability history, my own and the part of Action T4 that took place within these very walls merge, resulting in a calm both caused and comprised of equal measures of disbelief and sadness. Back up on ground level, I pass a window with a piece of paper on which is written, Vergessen nur nicht. Just do not forget.